colorful and controversial, Rocco Galati isn't your average advocate. He's a kind of legal David known for tangling with Goliath-sized courtroom opponents. His peers seem to approve, electing him just last week to the bench that oversees them. His latest case may be his most contentious of his entire career. Galati has successfully sued the government before. Last year, when Prime Minister Stephen Harper nominated Quebec Judge Marc Nadon to the Supreme Court, Galati stepped in, saying the move broke the rules. No one expected him to win. Galati surprised them. His latest lawsuit targets the very role of the Bank of Canada. The bank was set up in 1935 in the wake of the Great Depression to provide a means for settling international accounts. The lawsuit claims the bank would also provide interest-free loans to government to finance infrastructure investments like the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Trans-Canada Highway. The case argues that in 1974, the bank stopped providing interest-free loans to government and suggests the move was made to join the International Bank of Settlements, a kind of central bank of central banks. On behalf of his clients, Galati argues that from then on, private banks became government's lender, a change he says contravened the act that established the central bank and was therefore unconstitutional. His client, the Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform, or COMER, is suing to force the bank to make those interest-free loans to government again. The bank hasn't filed a statement of defense, but says the case is frivolous. Still, Galati is pressing ahead. When I caught up with Rocco Galati recently, I wanted to know why it was important to bring the case now. Well, my clients felt it was important. We, we initiated the claim in 2011. They felt it was important in the face of the financial uh, sector meltdown in 2008, the banking meltdown, and the drastic reduction and elimination of human uh, capital infrastructure, such as healthcare, universities, and basically the, the stuff that the Bank of Canada from 1938 to 1974 funded, which put us uh, head and shoulders uh, above most of the G8 countries in terms of financial stability and uh, uh, sustainable social services. So if you are successful, what would happen after that? What's the next well, step? If successful, the next step would be a request, another request to the Minister of Finance for uh, interest-free loans for a particular in uh, infrastructure project or funding. And if the answer is no, we judicially review that on the legal test of reasonableness, which the courts have, have the, the jurisdiction to review. Because what you're suggesting is that various levels of government, including provincial, could access interest-free loans, uh, one would expect that the provinces might be quite interested in this in this case, even if the federal government isn't inherently interested in it. Why are they not more? Well, they're not because they've agreed as of 1974 to be bound by the orders and dictates of the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, which is in effect a central bank for central banks. Now, the only difference and problem is that Canada, most people don't know, is the only G8 country to have a public bank. There's a difference between a central bank and a public bank. Anybody can have a central bank. We do. Ours is public. The U.S. Public, uh, a central bank is a private bank, the Federal Reserve. The Bank of England is a private bank. So all the European banks are private. So you have foreign private bankers dictating to a public civil servant and minister of justice what to do in this regard of a law from parliament. Can we just make the distinction between private and public? Because we don't think of the Federal Reserve as uh, private. We think of it as an, an arm of that government. No, it's not. People have shares in that bank. It's like the Bank of Montreal or the TD Bank. It's a private bank. It's huge, but it's a private bank. They're, they're, uh, they're beholden to their show, shareholders at the end of the day. So it's a private bank like any other. So the notion is that because of all of those central banks' participation in the Bank of International Settlements, they are then manipulating what our public bank can do. Correct. They're dictating what our public bank can do. The net effect of that is this. We effectively, through the Bank of Canada, have relinquished our sovereignty to private banking interests. We are saying to private individuals abroad, you can control our public bank and we'll follow your dictates. That Bank of International Settlements, though, of course, is designed to create stability globally. Central banks coordinate activities uh, to some extent, but with that in mind, not with any kind of private gain for those banks in mind. Well, look, that's not true what you just said. At the end of the day, that organization is there to secure the profitability of the central banks. 
we don't have necessarily a profit, profit motive because we are a public bank. Those other pub, uh, 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 central banks are private banks. So at the end of the day, profit is still the bottom line. It doesn't matter how you dress the chocolate. It's what's inside that counts. You know, I get a lot of people saying, you know, this, these are conspiracy theorists. And my answer often is, well, first of all, you have to look at the issue, look at the law. And often I respond to people by saying, if you think of my, my clients or myself are conspiracy theorists, then you must be a coincidence theorist. But the thing of it is that conspiracy is an indictable criminal code offense in Canada for good reason, because since Julius Caesar, conspiracies happen every day. They don't have to be nefarious. They can be very civil and in the open, but it's just a conspiracy. A conspiracy simply is an agreement to affect a certain end. It doesn't have to be criminal. It doesn't have to be nefarious. But so to say that they're conspiring, well, they're sitting down and they're agreeing to certain things and giving orders to our bank, which they shouldn't do under our Constitution. Just argue for me or help me understand mm -hmm. the, uh, the counter argument here. Uh, if the government, the federal government, could avoid paying massive amounts of interest on debt and borrow interest-free from the central bank, why wouldn't it choose to do that? What, what's the argument it would advance to say, no, that's the wrong thing to do? Well, it, it, on, the, on the face of it, it says because the banking community, quote, the banking community would not like it. Well, that's saying foreign private bankers don't like it, and my answer to that is too bad. It's the law. Second of all, the, the Minister of Finance has repeatedly given this mantra that it creates inflation, which is nonsense and borne out by the fact that in 2008, when there was the financial collapse of the banks, the Obama administration gave $800 billion to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve simply created $800 billion, interest-free, and bailed out the banks. We here, through the Bank of Canada, gave three, three banks $60 billion and secretly uh, assumed their toxic debt of $160 billion through the defaulted CHMC mortgages. So none of that bailing out the 0% interest of the banks caused any inflation. So why should it cause inflation when it never did historically from 1938 to 1974? So assume uh, that things go as you would like mm. and that ultimately you can say to the finance minister you must abide by this ruling and he doesn't. Does this become a protract then a protracted legal fight around trying to change behaviors from people who don't want to, they don't want to borrow interest free? Well, mo mo most struggles to enforce the law are. I mean, often, you know, I've had cases that have gone 12 years successfully at the end of the day because the government simply wants to ignore the law. It's not a new thing the governments ignore the law. I mean, but that's, that's the system we have. When they do, the only people who can force them to abide by the law are the courts. And so, what appealed to you about this case? What was it that, because it's sort of arcane, it's mm -hmm. very complicated, uh, but what, why did you say, yes, this is a fight I want to take on? Well, it's, uh, it appealed to me because although it's, a, it's arcane in the sense that, you know, anybody who knows something about economic theory and um, economic history may think, oh, this is arcane. This is the new flavor of the day. We don't use interest-free money. But it wasn't arcane for me because it's in the law. Whether it's arcane on the street is one thing, but the law says they can and do have the power to do this. The bank was created for that purpose, and now they've handed over the functioning of the bank with, with respect to currency and interest uh, 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 positions and uh, policy to foreign private bankers, which, 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 uh, which causes two constitutional problems. One, under our constitution, you could, a government and the executive cannot refuse to govern. They have to apply the law. But here, they've given the application of the law surreptitiously to foreign private bankers. Well, that's unconstitutional. You can't relinquish sovereignty. Rocco Galati's lawsuit against the Bank of Canada is the latest in a long line of legal battles he's brought against the federal government. But taking on those controversial cases comes with a price. One of Galati's biggest breakthroughs came in 1999. He represented Mavis Baker, a domestic worker who had lived illegally in Canada for many years. The government had decided to deport her. Up until then, it did not have to disclose why. Galati lost the deportation appeal, but he struck a blow for democracy when the court agreed with him government should be publicly accountable for its decisions, a landmark ruling that changed government forever. 
No one is underestimating Gulati in his latest fight over the Bank of Canada's business. His cases can seem improbable, but Gulati has a long history of coming from nowhere to win. In the second part of our conversation, I wanted to know more about what motivates him and why he thinks governments need challenging. I've been taking on government successfully since the mid-90s and in 99 at the Supreme Court level. I have sued uh, ex-Prime Minister Cretchen's government and Prime Minister Cretchen more times than I've sued the current government. For me, it's not about a particular government. When government goes astray, in a constitutional democracy, there are only two checks and balances to a government going astray and going uh, wayward of the, uh, the law and the constitution. One is the opposition in parliament. One is the parliamentary system, which in my respectful view, starting with the uh, prime ministership of uh, uh, Jean Chrétien, became pointless and useless. It's a charade. The other more important balance to executive action and parliamentary excesses of the constitution are the courts. That's the only, if you take away the courts, then you have what I say has been happening slowly in Canada is a quiet dictatorship. If you take the judicial check and balance away from the executive and parliament, you have one man rule, un unrestrained. Which I think many will argue is the ultimate importance of the Nadon case. Of course, that's why I took it on. I saw, I saw an attempt to pervert and subvert our independent judiciary, which is the last bastion of balancing the rights of the citizens as against the government and making sure that the government doesn't turn into a dictatorship. If you can stack the court and corrupt the judiciary, well, that's it. It's complete. Do you believe uh, that the, the way the court ruled on that, the language it used, the, the expression, is uh, an acknowledgement of that, that the court needs to protect itself from meddling? Clearly. That's why it constitutionalized itself. Most people don't understand the, the seismic importance of that decision. It said you can't do anything with this court without the consent of all 10 provinces on a constitutional amendment. Something that c would not have been affected if they tried, because you can't get 10 provinces to agree. And so, yeah, that was the seismic import of that case. It protected the court. The court took the occasion by us bringing the, the case to the court to constitutionalize itself. Is it frustrating to you, when you look back, the way that case was covered, it, d it never did point to that issue. Oh, yeah. It's only in the aftermath that people will look back and say something important happened there that was a good imp important thing. When it was being covered it was who is this pesky guy? Why is he chipping away at the prime minister? You know, what does it matter? Is that well, frustrating? That's that's frustrating, but I I have a long history of this in terms of, you know, back in the 90s I challenged the constitutionality of the multilateral agreement on investment in the OECD. I was a lawyer who went to the Supreme Court, didn't get leave on the 201 summit of the Americas in Quebec City for the protesters and we challenged the FTAA, that trade deal. And so I'm used to, I'm used to this. In, in a lot of my cases uh, that I win, in every single one case that I take, the government response is always, it's ludicrous. The press saying, what's he going on about now? It's got no merit. And in fairness to the government, in 37% of the time, they're right. I lose 37% of my cases. But in the other 63%, they still have the same mantra. It's no merit. Let's get it out of the courts. But, you know, th this is part of the battle that you go through when you, when you engage in constitutional litigation. You're not doing this to get rich. No, I'm not doing this to get rich. I could, you know, I'm a tax lawyer by, by training and profession. If I wanted to be rich, I'd do nothing but tax cases. In fact, even in some successful cases, you have spent more than you've been awarded in costs. Well, in the Nadon case, I, I put out $42,000. I was awarded half of uh, $5,000, including HST and disbursements, which means I, I was awarded nothing. So you're essentially making a personal investment in these cases? As a citizen, as a lawyer, yeah. Somebody's got to do it. It's like the challenge we brought to the New Citizenship Act, which is now in the Federal Court of Appeal, where they purport to be able to strip a Canadian-born citizen of his citizenship or her citizenship. I mean, that's been unheard of since 1608, when they tried it for the first time. And 14 judges, uh, including Lord Cook, said, no, you can't. If you're born here, that's it. End the story. So, Why aren't there more lawyers doing what you're doing? Uh, primarily three reasons. One is that every lawyer in the country except two of us, me and my associate that I've met, wants to be a Supreme Court of Canada judge. It's a bit delusional, but everybody is a titan in their own mind. Secondly, 
uh, uh, people don't, you know, people have to put, uh, raise their family and pay their expenses. They don't want to be liable to personally pay these costs. And thirdly, to be frank, uh, we do a bad job of teaching and encouraging constitutional law and thinking outside the box and thinking that there is something more supreme than Parliament. Because when we patriated the, the Constitution, as the Supreme Court has pointed out many times, we no longer live in a parliamentary supremacy. We live in a constitutional supremacy. And so Parliament has to keep within the limits of its powers. You, uh, in fact, one of your early victories was forcing governments to be accountable for decisions that they make, for right. rulings that yeah. they make. Yeah. And I think in legal circles, people would point to that as a hugely important development. Right. For the in 1999, uh, I co-counseled for Roger Rowe, who, who was the prime uh, counsel on that, on the Baker case, which broke uh, 200 years of administrative law that said any time a government official makes a decision that affects your life or livelihood, they have to give you written reasons. It wasn't the law before that. But more importantly, that case also uh, ruled something else, that when interpreting domestic Canadian law, we must comply with international treaty norms, whether we've signed the treaty, whether we've ratified the treaty or not. We are the only country in the Western world in any democracy that has that ruling, which, which keeps us in check so we don't go too far astray. How do you decide wh wh whether a case is something you want to do or not? I, I tend to decide on whether or not it, it has to have a constitutional issue and it's got to go to the integrity of governance or the violation of somebody's rights, uh, you know, that are, uh, that are human rights or charter rights. That's how I decide to take a case. Otherwise, if you want, if you want a divorce settlement, you go somewhere else because I think reasonable people should reasonably solve their own private problems. I only do cases against the government because when the government's after you, there is no making a deal. And have you paid a price other than the, obviously, the costs that can be involved, the personal time commitment? Have you paid a price for that, for being this thorn in the government side over time? Oh, I'm sure. I'll never get a judicial appointment. I've never had an interview when I've applied to teach at law faculties. I've applied 147 times, never got a single interview. And so people personalize things. They don't look at the issues.